Thank you.
Thank you.
Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Sabrina and I will be presenting this webinar today which will discuss the donor management and volunteer management systems and how you can simplify your processes using cloud computing. We also have a representative from Amazon Web Services with us today and we hope to introduce to you the benefits of cloud computing and why you should consider hosting your DMS and VMS on cloud. But first, let's go through some webinar housekeeping. Your audio and video will be turned off for the duration of the whole webinar. So, should you have any questions anytime throughout the duration of the webinar, you're encouraged to drop us a question by clicking on the Q&A tab on the top right corner of your Microsoft Teams window. Our team will be on standby to answer your questions as they come in. The slides and materials we'll be using today throughout this webinar will be available for download at the end of the webinar, so be sure to have your phones ready to scan the QR codes when they appear on your screens. Finally, please let us know if you or your team members are facing any technical difficulties. Here's the agenda for today's webinar. First, AWS will be explaining to you the definition and benefits of cloud computing services and how it can boost your organization's processes. Following that, you'll hear more about the digital trends seen within the public sector and nonprofits in 2022 and a brief introduction to Thunderquote's digital transformation tools. Next, we'll elaborate on what DMS and VMS are, the common considerations in implementing them, and their benefits for your organization. Finally, we'll cover some key decisions you'll need to deliberate before implementing a VMS and DMS system, and we'll end the webinar by briefly going through some grants that SSAs and charities can tap into before going into the Q&A session. Before we jump into DMS and VMS, I'll pass the floor to AWS to get you acquainted with what cloud computing really is and how your organization can benefit from cloud computing. Hi everyone, this is Leander from Amazon Web Services. Today, I'll be covering cloud computing and AWS 101, as well as some of AWS's offerings and programs to support nonprofit organizations. Let me begin by sharing on cloud computing and the difference between traditional on-premise infrastructure. In the on-premise model, you provision and manage all the equipment, for example, your servers, routers, and hard drives. All of these are things you need to buy, set up, and secure in your server rooms. Organizations generally pay for IT upfront, and they are usually long-term contracts that some traditional providers may lock you in for three to five years or more. Now, with these cycles, your teams might be caught up with the maintenance of agent infrastructure, licenses, or just get stuck having to work with older and slower platforms. For example, most organizations usually provision more capacity than required too, so that they can make sure they accommodate spikes in, let's say, donor or volunteer registrations, but ultimately, this spare capacity is ended up not being used. In the end, there is huge sunk cost, less efficient utilization, and this takes away resources from value-added work. Now, with cloud computing, you pay as you go and only provision what you need on an on-demand basis. Think of it like water and other utilities. You turn on the tap when you need to use it, but you don't need to provision all of the piping and infrastructure to get it all. For example, if you have a sudden spike in visitors to your site or application, you can quickly deploy new cloud servers in minutes to scale capacity and accommodate that load. You pay for these servers that you use by the hour, and when you're finished, you can just close them and stop the billing. It's very flexible. On AWS's part, we also have a very comprehensive documentation to enable IT teams to manage the cloud easily on top of our in-house technical teams and partners like Thunderquote. You can also migrate all the new applications easily, whether they are existing license deployments or out-of-the-box solutions or software as a service. Ultimately, running applications on the cloud allows you to be more flexible, cost-efficient, and agile. We do have some general solutions for nonprofits that are very simple to get started with. For core services, we are talking about hosting for websites, applications, and microsites or even storage for files, media, and other objects, and even virtual contact centers that, that run on the web. 
Some organizations also look to optimize their IT with a hybrid deployment. For example, their main servers being on-premise and having a backup and recovery plan on the cloud. Migration, modernization, and IT governance is also an essential for AWS, and we provide many tools to track IT access, compliance, and data protection. We are the first cloud service provider to attain the Singapore multi-tier cloud security standard level three certification, which assesses how we manage security controls, architecture, and security risks. The rest are a good mix and match of different use cases from data visualization, stakeholder engagement, and content delivery. I don't wish to go into much detail here, but I would be very glad to dive deeper in a separate session. Do feel free to contact us at any time. What we hope for is to be able to work backwards from your organization's requirements and see what services and resources we can utilize to support you. One of those resources are our public sector credit support programs that reduce your AWS spend for services that you utilize using a specific AWS account. It generally works by offsetting the expenditure per billing cycle. For example, if you have $1,000 in credits and spend $100 a month, the $100 will be offset per month until the credits run out. We want to help you drive mission impact and innovation with these credits. And the main thing we want to encourage is proof of concepts and experimenting different ways to enhance your organization's performance and operational capabilities. Now, there are a bunch of credit programs available for organizations to use, and we are really keen to use these to support your growth. Do feel free to contact myself and my team to discuss about credit options so that we can find the right credit support program for you. Our contact information will be available at the end of the slides. And I think that's all on my part. Let me pass the time back to Thundercode. Thank you for that very informative sharing about cloud. Now, let's take a look at some of the digital adoption trends we have seen within the nonprofit sector in the year 2022. Ever since the pandemic hit, most operations have gone online, and that includes payment methods. Just as people have resorted to wearing masks and gloves for protection at the height of the pandemic, contactless methods have emerged as a preferred choice of payment, expecting to triple in amount by the year 2024. While many nonprofits have gone cashless even before the pandemic, it has only cemented into normalcy when the pandemic occurred because at its peak, digital giving via debit or standing order was at 38%, making it the most common method of giving. Now, what is considered in the endemic phase, we see a continuation of using cashless methods as a method of giving, even with in-person donations, as the world slowly returns to normal due to its efficiency for both the giver and the charities. Other than that, as we continue to use popular social media platforms, along with the rise of TikTok and live streaming platforms like Twitch, this opens up another channel for charities to use for outreach and fundraising purposes. Organizations can now reach out to influencers and micro-influencers to host fundraisers on their platforms, such as live stream fundraising events and gaming for charity or even hire them for influencer driven promotions to drive traffic to your events other than being able to tap into their audience another benefit to social media outreach via influencers is that it helps you to reach out to younger demographics that would otherwise be less interested or maybe less exposed to charity content Digitalization has also started to take over training fields as nonprofits have now used virtual reality as a method of training for simulations that are harder to recreate in real life. Such simulations include high risk and difficult situations like dealing with suspected child abuse as done by the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, NSPCC UK. Not only is their VR program called Talk To Me used for training uh, and building confidence in people working directly with children, it is also free to use 
as an effort to spread awareness on how to deal with children who may be victims of child abuse. And while VR may need more research and a lot of investment, it does show us that the nonprofit sector is more than ready to explore creative and out of the box solutions to their difficult problems. Finally, organizations in the nonprofit sector have started to see the benefits of cloud computing for their team. Due to a limited budget, adopting cloud computing can be daunting at first when you have to factor in different costs like consultation and migration services along with the cloud services cost itself, but research has shown encouraging cost-effective benefits and a better return on investment. Thundercode has noticed in the past that a lot of nonprofits and SSAs do realize that they want to digitally transform and adopt new solutions in order to automate a lot of their processes so that they can focus on essential work that matters. However, they do have some doubts uh, on where to begin and which systems and solutions they should implement first. From our experience, Thundercode has developed three tools that can help nonprofits and SSAs in their journey. These tools are the Digital Infrastructure Roadmap, the Digital Compass, and the Digital Navigator Matrix. The TQ Digital Infrastructure Roadmap is basically an ideal roadmap of what an organization's digital transformation journey should look like. It is divided into three main branches, namely the governance tools, the productivity tools, and the service delivery tools. The governance tools are more of your internal facing tools, such as accounting software, donor management system, and volunteer management system. Meanwhile, productivity tools are tools or software that help your teams to increase productivity and efficiency, which includes tools like Microsoft 365, video conferencing tools, and even customer relationship management systems or client service tools. Finally, the service delivery tools are more specific as it is based on what kind of service delivery your organization provides. So not all of these tools will apply to your nonprofit. The second tool that TQ created is the Digital Compass specifically made for charities, which is for you to self-diagnose your organization and determine what your goals and priorities are during your digital voyage. Like a compass, it is divided into four points, representing four different areas of importance and priority that you need to consider for your organization, which are your North Star, team buy-in, external stakeholders, and support systems. Finally, the third tool is called the Digital Navigator Matrix, which is created for the purpose of helping you decide what tools or systems to prioritize in your digital transformation journey by measuring how difficult it would be to implement against how impactful the system will be for your operations as well as your organization's North Star. So this is just a brief run through, of course, for a more in-depth explanation on how to use each of these tools as well as to download these resources, please scan the QR code on your screen or head over to the link provided. With that, we'll move on to the next section of the webinar, which is on donor management systems. You might be familiar with the term, but a DMS is essentially a platform that nonprofits can use to manage any and all data and information you have about your donors. The DMS will be able to help you organize your database of contact details, analyze the data or any trends relating to your donors, as well as engage and communicate with your donors effectively. DMS is also sometimes known as a Nonprofit Constituent Relations Management, or CRM, as they share similar functionalities. Here are some key features that a DMS should have. First, your DMS should of course be able to manage your donor's contact details as it is the most basic feature of a DMS. Along with it, your DMS should be able to build individual profiles of your donors 
and view their donation history, background information, and other basic information you have previously collected of your donors. This information plays an important part in getting to know the pattern of your donors in order for you to engage with them more effectively and create a more personalized marketing campaign to target them. Next, a DMS should include fundraising and donation tools. This is especially beneficial for online donation campaigns, which will require creating a donation page and payment gateways, as well as allowing recurring donations and crowdfunding. On top of that, you should be able to utilize a donor engagement tool in your DMS. Besides email marketing and automated email invoices, most DMS include a more varied method of communication, which includes SMS, WhatsApp, and Facebook Messenger. Following that is, of course, the analytics and reporting feature. This is how you'll be able to gather all of your data on your donors and analyze their trends and history, and then produce reports from it to provide insight into your donor's donation patterns and behavior so that you can understand and use it to focus your engagement and communication strategies accordingly. Last but not least, most DMS also allow integrations with accounting softwares and payment gateways so that you will be able to automate your donation tracking and accounting processes. You might be wondering, what are some common pitfalls or considerations when it comes to implementing a DMS? Here are a few. Many nonprofits face the issue of decentralized data sources, which can slow down the process of consolidating their data into the DMS. To put it simply, before deciding to implement a DMS, their documents are scattered across many different devices and cloud storage owned by different people. While it may be difficult to consolidate large amounts of data at the beginning of implementing a DMS, we cannot stress enough how beneficial it would be in the long term for your organization. Not only will it be easier for you to navigate and access, it will also simplify the process of sharing the data with your colleagues and allows for data analysis and reporting, which can fuel your future decision-making processes. Besides that, a DMS may not be utilized to its fullest potential because a DMS offers many different features beyond just basic data management it can be overwhelming at first to explore their features and your organization might end up underutilizing them instead. This is also linked to the third point, which is a DMS's relatively high learning curve, especially in a more large scale DMS with many different features, which can be easily overwhelming for your staff. In order to avoid this, you need to ensure that adequate training and proper support systems are provided throughout your transition period so that you can reap the benefits of the DMS in the future. So despite these arguments, we still highly recommend looking into implementing a DMS because it can be very impactful and beneficial to your organization. The first benefit of using a DMS is that it enables a higher and more effective engagement with your donors. Because you have the facts and the numbers from your DMS analytics and reporting, you can finally zero in on specific communication and engagement strategies that target your donors better. On top of that, the type of content that you create can also be more streamlined to a more specific targeted audience based on the demographics of your donors. You can also automate emails for receipts and invoices, as well as outreach emails that you need to send out after any specific processes using a DMS. Secondly, because your DMS can help tell you about the trends of your donor's behavior, you can study their patterns and determine their donation preferences, whether they're more likely to be recurring donors or one-offs, their preferred payment channels, as well as when they're more likely to donate during the year. This information then fuels your marketing strategies in the future, which can guide you to promote future fundraisers better 
or even identify prospective donors, among other things. Finally, you can use DMS to ultimately automate the tracking of your donations. Process automation is one of the biggest time savers for your staff, and a DMS will be able to help you so, uh, so that you don't have to do recurring processes manually anymore, like donation matching or donation tracking, which frees up your team's time and allows them to focus on serving your communities better. Let's take a look at a case study by a Sudanese nonprofit organization called Lift Up the Vulnerable, which was a newly rebranded nonprofit from an organization that was previously shut down. In short, they did not have any donor management system in place to engage with their donors and store donor information. As they were reaching the end of the year, which happens to be a major season of giving in Sudan, they implemented a DMS as quickly as possible to help them kickstart a fundraising campaign. As a result, they managed to conduct different methods of outreach besides just email marketing, thanks to the DMS, and managed to collect $300,000 in less than three months after implementing their DMS. Moving on, let's talk about volunteer management systems. A VMS is essentially a platform that allows you to completely manage your volunteers from end to end. Usually, this goes from the recruitment process to volunteer data management, including their interests and skills, allowing your organization to engage with these volunteers, as well as analyze relevant data and trends from your volunteer base. A VMS is also used as a part of nonprofit CRM. Here are some key features of a VMS. First is the volunteer profiles and skill matching feature, which is especially useful for SSAs and nonprofits that require specific skills for certain projects. Unfortunately, not all VMS has a skill matching feature included. A VMS also has time tracking, scheduling, and rostering features, which help to cut down on manual scheduling and rostering tasks, as well as manual volunteer hours calculation. Then, most VMS also include communication tools like email, but also in app communications so that volunteers can communicate with you or with one another in the volunteer community. There's also recruitment tools in AVMS, which assist either with the start of a recruitment process or with recruitment marketing, branding, outreach, and engagement with prospective volunteers. Lastly, most VMS have program management features as well. This is useful for organizations that arrange and manage many programs and activities at once, as you'll be able to use this feature to track which volunteers are involved in each program, as well as track the progress and statistics of each program, like attendance and engagement. Like with any system, there are some pain points organizations have faced in the past during the process of implementing a VMS. The first is the volunteer hours inaccuracies due to human error. As volunteers can forget to log their volunteer hours, it will affect your statistics and data accuracy. To solve this, we recommend investing in more training for each volunteer to regulate the reporting and logging of their volunteer hours to ensure that they understand its importance. Alternatively, a lot of VMS do offer mobile apps, which may be easier for your volunteers to track their hours without having to go through the hassle of turning on a computer. The second pain point to consider in regards to implementing a VMS is the underutilization of its features 
just like a DMS, especially when you fail to automate recurring essential processes. Since a VMS can offer various features, it is really important to explore them and see which of your existing manual processes can be automated by the VMS instead. Although it may take some time, just like a DMS, it is worth learning to ensure benefits in the long run. Finally, many nonprofits lack a central source of data and resources at the beginning of their system implementation in order for a VMS to function effectively. This can be easily remedied by hosting all your data and resources into one hub in your VMS so that it can act as a central repository for both staff and volunteers to easily access. The first benefit of a VMS is that it can help you to consolidate your resources into a centralized source. For example, your training resources can be consolidated into one place, which helps to cut down on the time spent on training each volunteer individually by allowing them to access the resources themselves for self-training and self-learning. Secondly, you can streamline your volunteer hour reporting and time tracking, cutting down even more time you might have spent tracking this manually. Lastly, a VMS can help you build stronger relationships with your volunteers and engage with them easier. Since you have all of their information in one platform, it acts as a one-stop shop for communication and engagement purposes. As an example of a VMS implementation, let's look into Zero Waste Singapore, a nonprofit organization dedicated to help Singapore eliminate excessive waste and accelerate towards zero waste. Because they require a lot of volunteers to run their large-scale events, they need a VMS to replace their manual volunteer recruitment and engagement processes. As a result of using a VMS, they manage to eliminate a lot of their manual processes and significantly cut down on the time taken for volunteer communication. Since they use WhatsApp to communicate with their volunteers, they can now use VMS to automate emails and communications as and when they need it. And because they now have a centralized database using the VMS, they are also able to build stronger relationships with their volunteers and engage a lot better. Before implementing any new systems or processes, whether that be a VMS, DMS, or anything else, we recommend that you first take these factors into consideration, which are manpower, change management, and capabilities. When it comes to manpower, you might need to consider which staff member will oversee the implementation of the solutions and changes. You may also need someone to act as the champion for the solutions to provide support and training, ensuring that everyone is coping well with the changes. In order to ensure a successful system implementation and digital transformation journey, you need to ensure that you have an effective change management plan in place, including what kind of support and initiatives will help your teams through the transition period. Last but not least, you'll also need to consider your staff's capabilities, especially whether or not they need additional capabilities in order to fully utilize these new solutions and processes. Other than that, you may want to assess what kind of training they will need and what topics will be useful uh, in their transition into the new processes. So before we wrap this webinar up, we'll touch on some grants that your organization can tap into for your organization's digital transformation. If your organization is a member of NCSS or are funded by MSF, you can look into the Community Capability Trust, or CCT, which has four SSAs, while non-NCSS member charities can apply for the Charities Capability Fund also known as CCF, 
subject to eligibility. The CCT grants for technology subsidies work on a co-funding basis where 80% of costs are covered for the first year and 50% of costs for the subsequent two years. It is split into three tiers, Start Digital, Go Digital, and Grow Digital. The Start Digital tier co-funds pre-scoped and green lane solutions capped at $30,000 per solution and $150,000 per SSA. Meanwhile, the Go Digital tier covers non-pre-scoped or large-scale corporate function solutions capped at $300,000 per project and the Grow Digital tier funds service delivery IT solutions specifically and capped at $450,000 per project. Meanwhile, the CCF for non-NCSS members offer various grants that cover different solutions like training, consultancy, and ICT solutions. One in particular, its ICT grant, has two different categories of funding. The first one is for basic infrastructure components covering 80% of the supported cost or actual expenditure for devices like laptops and printers as well as firewall devices capped at various amounts depending on the equipment. The second category is for digital solutions, particularly those that can enhance productivity and operational efficiency of charities, including VMS and DMS, covering 80% of cost, capped at $40,000 per charity. For more information on these grants, as well as other available grants, scan the QR code on your screen right now, or visit the link provided to find out more. And with that, we've reached the end of today's webinar. Before we move on to the Q&A session, we'd like to share with you some of the free resources available on Thundercode's website. To access our on-demand webinars and white papers, you can scan these QR codes or head to the links provided. Finally, as promised, here is the QR code for you to download our slides from today. And now, we'll allow for short Q&A sessions, so for those of you who have yet to submit a question, you're welcome to do that. But if you have no further questions, thank you for joining us today. You can get in touch with us through our email, inquiry at thundercoat.com, or visit us on our website at www.thundercoat.org. You can also contact AWS for more information and assistance through their representatives, Leander and Eichshin. Thanks again to AWS for lending their expertise in cloud computing and contributing to this webinar. And we hope that this webinar has helped you understand DMS and VMS and how cloud computing can ease your processes better. We'll allow about 10 minutes uh, for the Q&A session.